Section 7, his first brotherhood continued, Papa Ephraim of Katonakia, the brotherhood of Papa Nikiforos. Papa Nikiforos' brotherhood was in Katonakia, and he had two disciples, Father Procopius and Father Ephraim. He behaved very harshly towards them. If they didn't finish carving eight prosphorus seals each, they would not eat. There's no telling of all the shouting and unfair reprimands they heard from pa Papa Nikiforos. Sometimes his shouting was so loud that it disturbed the neighboring huts. Patience and meekness were forged into the disciples in the brotherhood. But in terms of prayer and the monastic life, Papa Nikiforos did not know very much. They passed their lives with the usual church services and a lot of work. His disciple, Father Ephraim, however, was a real spiritual fighter. His parents were poor and his grandfather was a priest. He had completed high school, which was a rare accomplishment in those days. In 1933, at the age of 21, he came to the Holy Mountain, where Papi, Papa Nikiforos was. This young man had a very good heart, but he was greatly pained by the lack of authentic patristic example and unerring guide. Furthermore, he also had difficulty because of his ego, which was wounded by the harsh words of his unlettered elders. The only aid he had in his spiritual struggle was reading the lives of the saints and patristic writings. In this manner, with great internal struggle, he gradually began to overcome the unavoidable waves of thoughts that novices typically have. He himself admitted the following regarding this period of his life besides, beside Papa Nikiforos. The other fathers were simple men. They, they did their handicraft, their church services, and nothing more. When I came to the Holy Mountain, I was seeking something, but I myself didn't know what it was. I was not satisfied by merely doing handicrafts and going to the church services. I wanted something more, something loftier than just that. Elder Nicky Forrest was good, but he couldn't lead me on the path that he himself had not traversed. Time passed and Father Ephraim could find no one to teach him a few things about the spiritual life. This is why he would later say, It is easy to leave the world, but difficult, but to find a spiritual guide and elder is extremely difficult. Since he had no one to guide him spiritually, he improvised. No one had taught him about the Jesus prayer. So what did he come up with to pray constantly? He associated every hour of the day in every room of their hut with saying various prayers, saints troparia for the most part. In this way, he tried to keep his noose constantly occupied with prayer and compunction. Thus, by the grace of God, he progressed in compunction so much that he was able to weep whenever he wanted and as much as he wanted. Because of his humble obedience to his harsh elder, and because of his constant tears, God allowed him to experience a lofty spiritual state during church services. One day, while Father Procopius was reading the Psalter and Father Ephraim was feeling compunction, he suddenly saw his noose leave his body and go across the ravine where it summoned all of creation to glorify God. As soon as he came to himself, he wondered, What was that? Whom can I ask? acquaintance with Elder Joseph. Papa Nikiforos is only now, Papa Nikiforos only now and then would go up to St. Basil's Skeet to serve the liturgy at the little hut of the teacher. This is what they called Elder Joseph. In 1935, he went there along with his young disciple, Father Ephraim, to serve liturgy. At that time, Father Ephraim was 23 and Elder Joseph was 38. As a new monk, Father Ephraim remained silent and reserved in front of those elders. After the Divine Liturgy finished, they briefly sat down together so that Elder Joseph could treat them with the customary refreshment. Elder Joseph immediately asked, Is Ephraim obedient? Yes, he is, replied Papa Nikiforos. Father Ephraim later said, At that moment, I felt like falling down and kissing Elder Joseph's feet because I had finally heard something spiritual. I felt that this elder had life and grace. Due to the prevailing spiritual indifference, everyone else would merely ask, Is your new monk smart? Is he a hard worker? Is he good at learning handicrafts? With just one look, Elder Joseph realized that Father Ephraim was a spiritual man and said to himself, What a shame. This boy is like a thirsty deer, and his elder doesn't have any water to give him. Yerenda felt sorry for him, but he didn't have any way to help him. He couldn't just go meddling in the business of another brotherhood. 
1936, Elder Nicky Foros decided to have Father Ephraim ordained a deacon to help him with the services. So when he went to Thebes that summer as usual, he took his young disciple with him to have him ordained as a deacon. When the bishop saw what a pious and serious monk he was, he insisted on ordaining him also to the priesthood despite his young age. When Yerenda found out that, the pop, that Father Ephraim had become a priest, he took advantage of the opportunity and asked Papa Nikiforos to send his young priest to do some liturgies for him. Papa Nikiforos readily agreed, and a few days later the new hero monk, Ephraim, set off on his own to serve the liturgy at the hut of the teacher. After the divine liturgy, Papa Ephraim asked Yeranda if they could speak privately. They agreed to meet at midnight. The truth is that Papa Ephraim had been so disappointed by the general indifference that he didn't expect much from Elder Joseph. He later told us, It was almost out of curiosity that I was motivated to speak with him. I never imagined that I would be united with him and that I would continue his legacy and what we read about in the Holy Fathers. Despite his distrust, his thirst for spiritual words was so great that he went five hours early. Since he had arrived so early, he sat on a little stone wall near Yerenda's hut and waited for him to complete his prayers. He looked out towards the salt ponds and the sea, and he enjoyed the view of the wilderness at night. While he was praying there, his tears flowed like a river without stopping for five whole hours. Meanwhile, Yeranda was having his doubts about speaking with Papa Ephraim, since he also knew quite well the prevailing spiritual indifference around him. He was thinking, what's the use of getting involved with Papa Ephraim? He's going to be like all the others. But since he had already agreed to speak with him, he told his brother, Father Athanasios, to call him in. Papa Ephraim came in. And said to Yeranda, I see that all the monks are occupied merely with their handicrafts, and there isn't anyone to discuss thoughts with or hear some spiritual advice from. So is our life really monastic, working from dawn till dusk, while being rudely humiliated and never hearing kind words? Where is the virtue? Where is the love? Where is the prayer? My child, be careful, he's your elder. It is he who God has revealed to you. You may neither leave nor judge him. But is that how an elder should behave? Why shouldn't I leave and find another elder who's more spiritual? Listen, my child, on the one hand you gave your vows to renounce the world, and on the other hand you want honor and compliments. Well, you're wrong. If you want to become a servant of Christ, you ought to accept everything he suffered for our sake. Scorn, insults, humiliations, and even being spit upon and beaten. If you endure all these things, then you are bearing a small cross and following Christ. With comfort and empty honor and courteous talk, there is no progress or salvation. Papa Ephraim's thirsty soul immediately absorbed all this advice from yet under like a sponge. Then Papa Ephraim revealed to him three high spiritual states he had experienced and mentioned that he had been weeping for five whole hours just then. Hearing this, Yeranda embraced him and solemnly said, My child, you have been looking for me, and I have been looking for you. From then on, a close spiritual relationship grew between them. Guidance from Elder Joseph From the moment that Elder Joseph assumed the responsibility of guiding Papa Ephraim, he taught him various things about obedience, silence, self-reproach, prayer, and beneficial thoughts regarding death, judgment, paradise, and hell. He taught him to say the prayer constantly, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Jesus Christ, alleys on me. Watchful over his thoughts. He also gave him a schedule for doing his prayer rope at night. At first he told him to say the prayer for only one hour. He also told him, you have to tell this to your elder, though, so that it is not considered self-will. Papa Nikiforis had no objections to his disciples' new schedule, not only because he acknowledged Yeranda's sanctity, but also because he had the great virtue of being free of envy. Thus, from that day onwards, the soul of Papa Ephraim was resurrected, and in essence his elder was Yeranda, while he continued to have Papi Nikiforos as his elder merely as a formality. The next time he went to serve the liturgy for Yeranda, Yeranda asked him if he did his komboskini, and he said, Yeranda, with the prayer, the tears run like a river from my eyes, 
and a fire is burning in my heart for Christ. Then Yerunda increased his prayer rope and began explaining to him what praxis and theoria are and what the fruits of noetic prayer are. Thus, through Yerunda's constant supervision and through Papa Ephraim's dedication to the struggle, in two or three months he became a fire with zeal and grace. This experience showed him the value of grace and obedience. Serving Liturgy At first, Papa Ephraim went to St. Basil's skeet once a week, but the more spiritually united he became with Yerunda, the more frequently he would go. Sometimes he would even go four times a week. With all his heart, Papa Nikiforos let his disciple go to the teacher to serve liturgy, because he could see that through Yerunda's guidance, Papa Ephraim was becoming more and more eager to be obedient and to work. Near the end of his life, Papa Ephraim said regarding that period of his life, I admit that I had a great struggle with thoughts over leaving Papa Nikiforos. But through the advice and prayers of Elder Joseph, I was able to remain obedient until the end. I don't regret it because grace showed me 40 years later that I had done the primary will of God. He also said something that all of us had felt. I have never loved and feared anyone else in the world more than Elder Joseph. His great fear was a result of his great love. For out of his ardent love for Yerunda, he was afraid of doing anything that might grieve him. In fact, he acquired so much reverence towards Elder Joseph and Father Arsenios that in the beginning and at the end of his private prayers, he always said, through the prayers of the Holy Fathers, Joseph and Arsenios. He revealed his thoughts and spiritual state to Yerunda in detail, and Papa Ephraim joyfully accepted his advice. Amazed at Yerunda's clairvoyance, Papa Ephraim said, Yerunda can, can, Yerunda can see everything inside me. The Holy Fathers say that nothing increases more than thankfulness and gratitude. Papa Ephraim offered both of these abundant, abundantly, not only to God, but also to Elder Joseph. Whenever an opportunity arose, he would volunteer his labor out of gratitude. He helped Elder Joseph's brotherhood with many material needs, while not neglecting his obedience to Elder Nikiforos. Once, when Papa Ephraim was very sick and in danger of getting tuberculosis, Elder Joseph went, kept him in his own hut and cooked for him. Elder Joseph even arranged for Mrs. Uh, Mrs. A. and Volos to send him cheese, eggs, butter, canned milk, etc., so that Papa Ephraim could regain his health. At first, Papa Ephraim objected because he didn't want to eat those foods on fasting days, but for the sake of obedience, he gave in. He ate everything yet and gave him until he got well. Yerenda told him, you have to for Andromaxi for sending you all that food. Divine Experiences Once when Papa Ephraim went up to St. Basil's skeet to visit Yerenda, he found him in a state of ecstasy in prayer. Yerenda hugged his head, put it on his chest, and continued praying without saying a word. He prayed for us. Yerenda, are you going to eat the cookies by yourself? whispered Papa Ephraim, longing to taste whatever Yerenda's soul was tasting. Yerenda applied pressure with his elbow to Papa Ephraim's side, signaling him to keep silence. After a while, Yerenda came in sigh said, My child, you don't, have, you don't have just a clean soul. You have a completely pure soul. This is what had been revealed to him while praying. On another time, Yerenda put his hand on Papa Ephraim's head and started praying for him. All of a sudden, he stopped. He couldn't continue because he was flooded with grace. Afterwards, Yerenda said, I was praying for you, and instead I received prayer. Whenever Yerenda was flooded with grace like that, it meant that God would fulfill his prayer request. Teachings Elder Joseph guided Papa Ephraim in many ways. He laid special emphasis on preserving one's original zeal. He said that if a monk does not manage to increase it, he must struggle by all means, not to let it decrease. Elder Joseph also pointed out to him that l losing zeal brings negligence, which crushes a monk. To avoid this pitfall, he advised him to read through the service of tonsure to the great schema from time to time. In this manner, he would be reminded of the vows he had given to God as well as his responsibilities. Above all, though, what benefited Papa Ephraim was the mere sight 
of the holy elder Joseph and his example. Once Papa Ephraim had intense carnal warfare. He lay down to sleep, but the warfare was very strong. To resist the temptation, he began saying the prayer fervently. Soon afterwards, he fell asleep and saw the following vision. Across from him at the front door was a demon, exactly as the Holy Fathers described them, with horns, black wings, and a menacing laugh. However, the demon couldn't approach his cell or enter it. When he awoke, he went and told Yerunda about what he had seen. Do you see, my child? Yerunda told him that by saying the Jesus prayer, you keep him at the gate, and thus he can't come near you. Visitation of Grace Papa Ephraim, as a true disciple, would tell Yerunda all his thoughts and never hide anything from him. In this manner, he quickly acquired streams of tears. He said to Yerunda, I have a lot of tears. And Yerunda responded, Tears are good, they cleanse the soul. Now you are digging and opening a road so that the vehicle of grace, the God's grace, can come in. This is how you will find grace, through tears. Another way to find it is through noetic prayer, which is loftier than tears. If tears come during noetic prayer, forget about the tears and keep the prayer in your heart. Tears diminish noetic prayer. Noetic prayer makes men experience grace more than tears do. About six or seven months later, the following incident occurred, as Papa Ephraim himself told it. One evening, after waking up, I washed my face and stood up to say the Jesus prayer with my prayer rope as usual. I was standing in front of my window that overlooks the sea. After finishing quite a few prayer ropes, all of a sudden I saw three luminous figures approaching me. My cell filled with light and an indescribable fragrance. My spiritual senses informed me that the middle figure was Christ, accompanied by two angels. I fell down and my soul embraced Christ's feet. I felt an amazing joy and delight. I was in such a heavenly state that it cannot be described. As he continued this story, he began to weep. I remained in that state of bliss for quite a while before it gradually began to subside. Suddenly, myself filled with demons. They surrounded me. I was terrified. I was petrified out of fear. I felt them beside me, and I shuddered with an indescribable fear. As I prayed, they gradually withdrew. While still trembling out of fear, I took my oil lantern and went to Elder Joseph. When I arrived, I said to Father Athanasios, Inform Yerunda that I need to meet with him at once. Yerunda received me immediately, even though it was at an inappropriate time. As soon as I sat down, he asked me, What's wrong? Wait a minute, Yerunda, so that I can come to myself and tell you. Due to the fear, I could barely speak. When I recovered, I related to him the incident with the three figures and the demonic presence afterwards. Then Elder Joseph stood up, embraced me, and said to me, full of joy, This, my child, is the first step. This is grace. Do you remember that I was telling you that through tears you are, in a sense, digging so that God, that God's grace, the grace's vehicle could pass? Well, now it has passed. From now on you will have revelations from God. He will inform you of things, and you will see differently. God's grace will manifest itself in images and shapes to help you. New horizons, different spiritual garments, a different spiritual food, and a different prayer await you. The demons came afterwards because they realized the state of grace you had and were envious. Later, Papa Ephraim said, the progress I made under Elder Joseph was due solely to his prayers and his guidance. He would tell you, this is how you should pray. This is how you should say the words. When you encounter difficulty, don't repeat the prayer in its entirety. Only repeat half of it. He teaches you how to say the prayer, how to live, how to pray. When you are tired and lose heart in the struggle to say the prayer, and you want to give it up, he comforts and strengthens you. He puts you back on track, so to speak. When Elder Joseph said, The more faith you have in me, the more spiritual progress you will have. It was as if he were saying, I have a spiritual treasure. Do you want some? Take as much as you want. From strength to strength. Soon after this, Papa Ephraim began experiencing lofty spiritual states. He received abundant grace from God, who kept raising him to higher levels that only people with experience can understand. All of this was because of the unerring teachings and prayers of Elder Joseph, who said to him, My child, 
the way you were progressing before we met, you would have found grace on your own, but you would not have been able to keep it. You found grace through tears, so continue with tears. But you are running quickly, and I'm afraid for you. Other people have spent a lifetime in Ascasis and haven't experienced these states, whereas you have been granted them by God so soon. Papa Ephraim responded humbly, Yerinda, if God gives me meat to eat, am I supposed to tell him to give me beans? Yerinda would boast in the Lord, saying about the advanced state of Papa Ephraim, I made him like that. Indeed, this was the truth, because Elder Joseph was his real elder. He is the one who made him a great vessel of grace. Notwithstanding, the temptations of Papa Ephraim were not small. Once throughout his entire vigil, the demons tortured him with thoughts about insignificant matters. In the morning, he went to Yeranda and told him about the harassment. Yeranda wisely inquired, What spiritual state have you had these days during prayer? A very good state. Then Yeranda nodded his head conclusively. Hmm. Don't expect only sweet things. Expect bitter things, too. When you are given a spiritual state full of grace, expect a temptation soon. Likewise, when you have temptations and grief, be aware that God's consolation is near. Yeranda supported him in words and deeds. He would give him advice, but he would not reveal to him his soul's spiritual path ahead of time. Only one time did he do so when he said to him, In the spiritual state you are in, be very careful not to be fooled by some fantasy. If you see an angel, don't fall before him immediately. Be careful because your spiritual state will be followed by a temptation. It is impossible for this not to happen. Naturally, Yeranda was speaking out of experience since he himself had already lived all these changes. He was no longer struggling to explore various spiritual states, but he knew at every step what he would encounter and what he must do to attract the mercy and grace of God. Instead of attacking Papa Ephraim directly, the devil instigated people against him. The great Lavra decided to punish him for being ordained by a zealot bishop without the Lavra's permission. They removed his name from their roster of monks, which meant that he would be considered a layman by the government and must therefore fulfill his mandatory term serving in the military. The police started searching for him, but Yeranda hid him. Yeranda did everything he could to make the Lavra add Papa Ephraim to their roster, but they would not give in. Finally, through the prayers of the Panagia, the governor of the Holy Mountain changed his mind and Papa Ephraim was allowed to stay. The only other time Yeranda revealed Papa Ephraim's future to him was when he told him, Papa, you will get amnesia and lose your memory when you're old. Sure enough, this did happen. God allowed it so that he would have humility and not think highly of himself. Their Liturgies The piety of Papa Ephraim was manifest especially during the Divine Liturgy. He said, When I served liturgy for Elder Joseph, I had overwhelming compunction and a flood of tears, a torrent. I could not contain myself when serving there. I must admit, though, that it was all because of Yerinda's prayers. He was taught how to intone the petitions and the rest of the liturgy by Elder Joseph, who in turn had learned it when his Zeus was seized in rapture. He took the tones and melodies from the chanting in the vision he had of little birds chanting the Terriyim. Ever since then, he taught the elders how to chant the Lord have mercy serenely, hesychistically, as if a voice was coming from afar. They chanted so quietly that their voices could not be heard from outside, even though their chapel was so tiny. They chanted quietly to preserve tranquility, because it is through quietude of the mouth that the soul cries out and communicates to God with God. Elder Joseph was delighted with those liturgies and the compunctions at, compunctious atmosphere that was created because everyone in his brotherhood was wholeheartedly devoted to worship and no thought removed their noose from prayer. He wouldn't let anyone else serve the liturgy for them because he didn't want to lose what they had. He even said, I believe that on all of the holy mountain there is no better divine liturgy than the one we do, the way we do it in this humble little chapel. Elder Joseph had experienced the fullness of noetic prayer, and his disciples followed him. Thus, the divine liturgy was a liturgy of prayer. Frequently during the divine liturgy, Papa Ephraim saw the grace of God tangibly fill the, filling the entire chapel. This is why he could say from experience, The Holy Spirit cannot be seen, 
but his grace can be seen. Grace flooded their hearts in that tiny chapel, and many times Papa Ephraim could see Christ as an infant on the holy paten. At such times his tears ran like a stream. One time at the consecration of the holy gifts he was informed of what is meant by the phrase, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, while feeling an intense ardor of spirit. Another time, when he went to rest after the divine liturgy, he suddenly saw a cherubim. With inexpressible joy, he embraced it and kissed it. When he told Yerenda what had happened, Yerenda explained to him that it was a manifestation of God's grace. Once during the liturgy, he saw the Trinitarian God in the holy gifts, and he recounted it as follows. I saw the entire Godhead in, in, in the holy gifts. I saw him with the eyes of my soul, but I can't describe it. Of course, man cannot see God and live, but I saw him in the sense that Moses did when he saw the back parts of God. At that moment, I find myself in a state of ineffable bliss, peace, love, divine eros, and tears. The living God was in the holy chalice. So then how can you dare approach the holy chalice? After such incidents, Yerandu would humble him by sweetly saying, You are traveling very fast, my dear priest. When Papa Ephraim served the liturgy and said, Peace be unto all, he had the thought, who am I to pray for peace to come from come to Elder Joseph? This thought concerned him for a while until one day he heard a voice coming from the stole. You are not the one saying it, I am saying it. He then realized that it is the Holy Spirit who is blessing through the priest. After so many heavenly events, it is no wonder that the abandoned chapel of Elder Joseph in the wilderness where Papa Ephraim served the liturgy for so many years is still fragrant. Whenever Papa Ephraim found himself in lofty states of prayer and couldn't restrain himself, Yerunda would tell him, Whether you have joy or sorrow, do not let it show. You might be inebriated in paradise or engulfed in hell, but you must not reveal it. This is best, so that others will not know what state you're in. Later, Papa Ephraim admitted with self-reproach, I had difficulty doing this. Yerunda, however, had mastered the skill of self-restraint. Even though he had always had intense compunction during those services in the chapel, only twice in his life did it overwhelm him so powerfully that he could not chant the Triubic hymn. Judging the Elder St. John of the Latter advises that before we bend our neck to the yoke of obedience, we should carefully examine whether the Elder is capable of leading us to salvation. After submitting ourselves to obedience, however, we should never judge our Elder even when we happen to notice some shortcomings. Otherwise, he concludes, we shall not benefit from obedience. The following story, told by Papa Ephraim, shows how dangerous judging one's elder is. One day, I had a judge judgmental thought against Yerunda. When I tried to pray that evening, it was as if there was a wall in front of me. I couldn't get anywhere with the prayer. I tried saying, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, and I couldn't. I said to myself, I must have done something wrong. I must have committed some sin. So I started thinking, yesterday, where did I go? What did I say? What did I do? Then I found it. I had judged my elder. The following day was Sunday, and I had to serve the liturgy. Now what do I do? I asked myself. Pray. God, forgive me for judging my elder. I made a mistake, and I'm asking forgiveness. Nothing. No improvement in my prayer. All right, isn't there forgiveness for me? Can't I say Evlogison, since I grieved you? Evlogison, nothing. I continued asking the Lord, Didn't you forgive Peter after he denied you three times? I didn't deny you, I just judged my elder. Well, now I am making a prostration to you. I have repented for judging him, and I am seeking forgiveness. Still nothing. I tried holding my komboskini, but I still couldn't pray. So then I began to weep. The tears flowed like a river. My God, my God... Can't I say of Logison? You are the God of mercy and compassion. Why don't you forgive me? You even forgave St. Mary of Egypt when she repented. You forgave many sinners, including the new martyrs who had previously become Turks. You forgave them and had mercy on them. Isn't there any mercy for me? Isn't there any forgiveness? Well, three hours passed like that. I did the entire Sunday service with tears. Finally, I felt a certain peace, a particular sweetness, a kind of joy within myself. Then the prayer began, 
to be said, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Ah, all right, I said to myself, and thus I was able to proceed to serve the liturgy. Judging your elder is not the same thing as judging some stranger. Woe unto you. It is something like judging God himself. Commemorating names. One day after liturgy, Papa Ephraim saw in his sleep some poor, ragged, wounded people before him, and they said to him, Father, you forgot us. When he woke up, he realized that he must not have commemorated all the names. He then asked, Yeranda, do you have any other names? No, I don't, Yeranda replied. They're all in the altar. Papa Ephraim searched and searched, couldn't find any extra slips of paper with names on them. After his next liturgy, Again, he had the same dream with poor people telling him, Father, you forgot us. After waking up, he said, Fathers, are you sure you don't have any names somewhere else? I'm sure, Papa. Check the altar table. Papa Ephraim searched some more and finally found a slip of paper with names underneath the edge of the altar cover. In his next liturgy, he commemorated those names, and those people never again appeared to him in his dreams. Strictness. The guidance of Elder Joseph was not at all honey, though. Not at all. He found flaws in Papa Ephraim to correct him in season and out of season in order to keep him safe in the haven of humility. As the Apostle Paul says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. A spiritual father must do everything to benefit his spiritual children. In the beginning, Papa Ephraim did not particularly like the food Elder Joseph gave him. To avoid eating it, he decided on his own to gather walnuts and eat them instead. This action of his, however, did not escape yet on his notice. He waited for the right time, and then one day he abruptly remarked on it and bluntly said to him, Papa, don't come here to serve the liturgy again. As soon as Yeranda said this to him, Papa Ephraim lost his prayer. Along with it, is he lost his tears, his joy, his compunction. He lost everything. He fell into despair and despondency. The next day, he ran back to Yaranda, jumped over the fence, fell at Yaranda's feet with tears, saying, Forgive me, I've logis, so I won't do it again. True to his word, Papa Ephraim never did it again, and he became like a little lamb. Another time, Papa Ephraim mistakenly came late to serve liturgy. He asked forgiveness, but Yaranda was not placated. He seized the opportunity to train Papa Ephraim in humility. After reprimanding him harshly, he currently sit, sent him away, saying, Get out of here and don't come back until I call for you. Yeranda kept him away for three days, despite the fact that Papa Ephraim begged him for forgiveness with tears. And as expected, those three days passed with spiritual deadness, not a single movement of grace. Poor Papa Ephraim. He was getting sh shouted at by Papa Nikiforos, shouted at, by Elder Joseph, and deprived of the grace of God, but it was all for his own good. Finally, on the fourth day, Yerana called him to come to serve the liturgy. During the divine liturgy, grace overshadowed him for the first time in days, and he rejoiced. When he told, his, when he told this to Yerana, he replied with his sweet fatherly demeanor, My child, couldn't you tell that in spirit I was embracing you? Then Yeranda explained to him the exactitude required for spiritual progress from praxis to theoria. Another time, Papa Ephraim opposed an order of Yeranda and was disobedient to him. Because of this, as he himself admitted, he not only grieved Yeranda, but was also severely chastised by God. He said, I tell you that just as it is written in the life of the Apostle Peter that he wept every time he heard a cock crow, recalling his de denial, Likewise, every time I remember that disobedience of mine, I weep for hours on end because I know that I shouldn't have done it and that I grieved not just Yeranda but the Holy Spirit as well. Through his obedience, Papa Ephraim reached such heights of virtue that Father Arsenios was astounded and said to Elder Joseph, My, my, we do such strict ascases, but he just does obedience and surpasses us. Stubborn Papa Nikiforos this may have been the case, but his obedience was no small feat. It was a sheer martyrdom because Papa Nikiforos treated him harshly for decades. One day, Yeranda asked Papa Ephraim, When will you come to serve liturgy for us next? On the feast day of St. John Chrysostom? All right. 
A little while later, their neighbor, Elder Gabriel, asked Papa Ephraim if he could come and serve liturgy for him on the day of St. John Chrysostom. Papa Ephraim replied, All right, we can do that. After all, both Yeranda Nikiforos and I are priests, so one of us can serve here, and the other can serve for Elder Joseph. When Papa Ephraim returned to his elder, Papa Nikiforos, he told him, Yeranda, forgive me, I am in a bind. I gave my word to Elder Gabriel that we would serve liturgy for him, but I had already told Elder Joseph that I would serve liturgy for him. Papa Nikiforos replied, When you give your word, give your word for yourself, not for your elder. You have to learn your place. I give my word for my spiritual child. A spiritual child doesn't give his word on behalf of his elder. Fine, yet under have Logison, but now I'm in a bind. I don't know what got into me. Anyway, you can go to Elder Gabriel, and I'll go to Elder Joseph. No, I'm not going. What's this you're saying? You're ordering me to go to Elder Gabriel? You have to realize your position and learn how to talk. Okay, I'm sorry. It's my mistake. I said, no, I'm not going. Papa Frem said to himself, Now what'll I do? Well, since I go to Elder Joseph all the time, this time I might as well go to Elder Gabriel. So Papa Frem served liturgy for Elder Gabriel, but he admitted later, My conscience was bothering me so much that I felt as if I committed a crime against Elder Joseph. If you commit a sin against someone else, it's not as serious as committing a sin against your elder. If you disobey someone else, it's not so serious. But if you disobey your elder, it's serious. The next time Papa Ephraim went up to see Yerunda, he said to him, Welcome back, Papa. Why didn't you come for St. John Chrysostom? After Papa Ephraim explained the whole story, Yerunda said to him, You fell into a temptation, and Papa Nikifor should have helped you. He should have said to you, Listen, my child, you are a disciple. If I were to tell you to go to Elder Gabriel, you would have to go. If you tell me where to go, I don't have to go. Do you understand how things work? But since you've, you've already given your word, I'll go to Elder Gabriel. You go serve liturgy for Elder Joseph. But don't ever do that again. Yet under, I was in a bind of Logison. Now what penance should I give you? Elder Joseph continued, Since God already gave you a penance through your conscience, I don't need to give you another penance. God has taught you how serious it is for a priest to break his promise, and even more so, a promise to his elder. Even though Yerunda forgave him, Papa Ephraim still suffered greatly from his conscience pricking him. Spiritual Bond The spiritual state of Elder Joseph was so lofty that Papa Ephraim drew a flood of grace from him because of their spiritual bond. As Papa Ephraim himself said, I remember those years. I experienced grace in torrents when Elder Joseph prayed for me. When I would kiss his hand as I was leaving, if he said wholeheartedly, Go, it was as if he were saying, Go and see. I would immediately abound in prayer and grace. On the contrary, if I had disappointed him in something, and if he abruptly said to me, Go now, then I would have a spiritual drought and abandonment. This was verified when one day he said to me, Go, you won't have any grace until Saturday. Indeed, for a whole week, my, my soul was frozen and dead. I was amazed to see how much power Yerunda's words have and how God ratifies them. The first thing that, that all of Elder Joseph's disciples found out was that God truly ratified his salvific words. This is a mystery that, that negligent and inexperienced people are, all, are unable to explain. One thing that can be said for sure is that the more united you are with your elder, the more grace you receive. It is just like iron. The more it approaches the fire, the more it becomes like the fire. While the farther it withdraws, the darker it becomes. Here is another incident revealing their spiritual bond as related by Papa Ephraim. One day as I began praying, I felt my soul was in pain and that pain that the pain was coming from Yerunda. I said to myself, Yerunda is suffering. What could I do? Pray. So I prayed and prayed from midnight until dawn. At 9 a.m., my soul stopped hurting. I said to myself, Yerunda must be better now. The next time I saw Yerunda, I asked him, By the way, Yerunda, on such and such a day, how were you? Yerunda replied, My child, I was suffering because the Nasi did this and that. I was in great pain. 
How long did your pain last? Until 9 a.m.? And then? Then I gave myself over to prayer and found consolation. God enlightened me to know about your suffering. That's why I prayed as hard as I could for you. But really, what could I do for Yerunda? I guess it was like the two mites of the widow in the Bible. Yerunda once told Papa Ephraim, If you are in a good spiritual state and go to a house, you can sense what kind of spirit dwells in that house. For example, if there is a spirit of prayer, a spirit of continence, a spirit of ascesis, or a spirit of lying, greed, theft, or witchcraft. Intellectually, Papa Ephraim understood what his elder was telling him, but in practice he couldn't grasp it because it seemed not just unbelievable, but a little preposterous. Then one day the following incident occurred, as Papa Ephraim himself described it. One day I went to serve liturgy for Elder Joseph. As soon as I entered his cell, I said, Yerondo, what's going on in here? What is it, he asked. A spirit of silence prevails in here, as if telling me, be quiet. A feeling immediately came over my soul, as if to inform me in a sense that there is silence in here. Let me explain, Yerondo said. Now, during Great Lent, on Saturday, we have a liturgy. We receive communion, we eat, and Father Arsenios and I may talk with each other until Sunday evening. On Sunday evening, we do a prostration to each other to ask forgiveness, and then all week long, we do not speak. If we want to get something done, we communicate only with hand signals. From then on, I understood through my own experience that Yerenda's words were right. Then Yerenda also added the following, Papa, I want you to read the prayer of absolution for me. What happened, Yerenda? The other day, I was trying to signal to Father Arsenios to go down and dig so that we could plant chickpeas. I showed him a handkerchief full of chickpeas and tried explaining to him with hand signals that, that he should use a pole to make holes in the ground to plant them. But Father Arsenios couldn't understand what I meant and started trying to talk with his mouth closed. Then he took the handkerchief and the chickpeas scattered everywhere. I got angry and gestured inappropriately to him. That's why I want you to read the prayer of absolution for me. Last words. Only those who have broken away from obedience, writes St. John of the Ladder, can fully appreciate its value. When Papa Ephraim was an old man, he recollected the good old days, and he said, Oh, blessed obedience, what can I tell you? When I was under obedience, I had a special kind of grace, a different kind of prayer. It was as if I were flying, for prayer springs from obedience, not obedience from prayer. Be obedient for now, and later you will acquire grace. Elder Joseph told us, When a person is obedient to an elder, it doesn't matter if the command is wrong. It will turn out well for him simply because he is being obedient. It doesn't matter who his elder is. What good did it, did it do Judas that he had Christ? None. What good did it do Gehazi that his elder was a prophet? None. What good did it do Adam who was in paradise and his elder in a sense was God, none, because he was disobedient. Yet Akakios, who is mentioned in the ladder of St. John of Sinai, suffered no harm even though his elder was grouchy, cantankerous, and even beat him. Despite this, he became a great saint. Decades later, as Papa Ephraim approached the end of his life on earth, he wanted to visit the huts of Elder Joseph and St. Basil's skeet one last time. As soon as he approached the abandoned chapel of Yerunda's cell, he said to his companion with deep emotion and a stream of tears, May his memory be eternal. May his memory be eternal. We were satiated with grace. We were satiated with grace. For three years beside yet under here, I drank water, the water of paradise. Oh, in those days when I used to go to St. Basil's Skeet, to Elder Joseph, what grace that was, what spiritual states, what liturgies, what theorias, what mysteries, what revelations, you would think that the shrubs and the crags and all of creation were glorifying and singing to God. Papa Ephraim passed away in 1998 after living an exemplary life of holiness. Two books about his life have been translated into English. Elder Ephraim of Katanakia, written by his disciples at the Hezekasterion, St. Ephraim in Katanakia, and published by... Uh, to Paravoli Tispanagias in 2003, and Obedience is Life, Elder Ephraim of Katanakia, 
written by Elder Joseph of Vatopedi, also published in 2003, 2003, end of section 7. Section 8, and the small skeet of St. Anne, moving out. No one lasted. It was not possible for a person, no matter how passionate he was, to live beside Yeronda and not be cured of his passions, as long as he was obedient. That heavenly man knew how to cure his disciples' passions with much discernment. All they had to do was remain beside him in obedience, to become like new men. Yeronda had much love and was full of grace, but he also was so strict and rigorous in his ascetical routine that it was difficult for people to stay with him. Since he had lived through all the various ascetical struggles, he knew exactly how God's grace is attracted and preserved. That is why his words were always brief and to the point. He would say, In this situation, you will do this. And he demanded complete obedience from the person asking his advice. Many people passed through and benefited from Yerunda, but almost all of them didn't stay. Many people with important positions and advanced degrees passed through, but as soon as Yerunda put them in the furnace of obedience, they would leave despite their initial zeal. No one could stay beside Yerunda unless he was ready to write himself off from this life. This is why his brotherhood never grew large. It was characteristic of him to say, I want to make him into a monk, a real monk, not something watered down. Yenunda would not turn people away. Out of love, he would welcome everyone who wanted to stay, who claimed to desire Hezekiah in the spiritual life. Time would tell, however, that although they had good intentions, they lacked the self-denial required by ascetical life in the wilderness. They also had some old habits deeply rooted within them that prevented Yenunda himself from keeping his ascetical program. This is why he would tell them, you would be better off going to one of the monasteries where there is security. Be obedient there and have a humble spirit. Thus in 1936, the only ones living with him were Father Arsenios, Father Athanasios, his brother, and Father John. There were, however, serious problems with their life at St. Basil's Skeet, which is why they decided to move elsewhere. The primary reason for their move was Father John, who was not being obedient at all. Not only would he not listen, but he also prevented Yerunda from living as hesychistically as he would want. Another reason for moving was the excessive physical labor required to haul all the necessary provisions up, up to such a high altitude. Third reason for moving was the disturbance from others. His reputation as a great ascetic had spread, and as a result, many monks went to him for advice. This made him lose his stillness, time for prayer, and freedom from cares. For all these reasons, Yeranda decided to leave along with Father Arsenios and Father Athanasios. Let's leave, he said. Let's go somewhere else to struggle so that people won't find, easily find us and rob us of our prayer in Hezekiah. An ideal location. On the southwest side of Manathos, on a steep wooded slope, lies the beautiful skeet of St. Anne, at an altitude of about 1,000 feet. It consists of huts built on terraces, one behind the other. Most of them are hidden behind gigantic trees or greenish-gray boulders. In those days, there were about 200 fathers living in the skeet. It is named after St. Anne, the mother of the Theotokos, because the largest known holy relic of hers is kept there. About half hour's walk from St. Anne's Skeet and the small Skeet of St. Anne. It is a small ascetical cluster of just five huts. It has a milder climate because a rock protrusion to the north protects it from the sharp cold coming from the summit of Mount Athos. Elder Joseph had heard from the other fathers of St. Anne's Skeet about some caves towards the small Skeet of St. Anne. After laboriously exploring they found the caves in the side of a cliff beneath the hut where the famous Papa Savas and the Georgian St. Hilarion had lived in the 19th century. A Russian ascetic, having lived in those caves, and there, and there were still two small cisterns there. This was a very secluded spot that few knew about. The place was very small, 
sort of like an eagle's nest. On one side were crags, on the other side was a deep precipice. They were very pleased with the landscape because they had absolute stillness. It was so secluded that only with great difficulty could anyone find them. Water from the rock. Thus, in January of 1938, they loaded their tattered garments and their few books onto their backs and moved to those two caves. When they arrived there, the only thing they found were those two cisterns. One cistern was open and was used for washing and irrigation. The other was covered and held potable water. They cleansed both cisterns as well as they could and gorged the face of the cliff, inserting tin strips to make a gutter of sorts. This is how they collected the rainwater, which was crucial since there was no well nearby. Thus, the little water that was collected barely sufficed for their most essential needs. Once again, they encountered the same problem they had at St. Basil's Skeet. As soon as they began to build a little hut and a little chapel, they realized that they didn't have nearly enough water. So once again, Father Arsenios had to haul it on his back from far away. One day when the sun was extremely hot, Yerunda felt sorry for Father Arsenios, and he prayed to the Panagia, My dear Panagia, work something out so that we have a little more water, because Father Arsenios is toiling very hard. As soon as he finished this prayer, he heard a boom from the boulder next to him. He turned to look, and what did he see? It looked as if the boulder was perspiring and water was dripping from it. So they put a vessel beneath it and, ga and began to gather the water. From then on, Father Arsenios no longer needed to haul water. Their huts. They built a hut in one cave and the little chapel in the other. Papa Ephraim of Katanakia also helped with the construction out of gratitude for all that Yeranda had done for him. He hauled red dirt on his back from the awe-inspiring Kurulia which Father Arsenios used to make bricks. Papa Ephraim managed to do all this without neglecting any of his own elders' needs. At first they stayed together in the hut, which was separated into three small rooms and a tiny closet. But to avoid idle talk, they later decided to build separate huts. Yeranda took a hut they built inside one of the caves 40 yards away. They found some old beams to support the sheet metal which they used as a roof. The hut of Father Arsenios's was a little further back, whereas Father Athanasios's little shack was built outside their enclosure because he frequently returned late from his endless errands of hauling provisions. They also built a doorway and a door at the only entrance to the enclosure so that even if someone happened to find them, they would not be able to get it. Their huts were so small that only with difficulty were their, were their needs met, even though their needs were minimal. The cell dimensions were about six by five feet. Instead of a bed, they had two or three planks covered with some patchwork. They made a small opening in the wall which was used as both a door and a window. That is how they went in and out. For fresh air, they had two holes that were covered with rags instead of curtains. The floor of their cells was damp and moldy. The cells were so cold in the winter that if you stopped moving, you would freeze, whereas in the summer, they suffered from the unbearable heat. The tin sheet above their heads broiled them. Even at night, it wasn't cool because the surrounding boulders would absorb the heat all day and then radiate it all night. It was like the Babylonian furnace heated sevenfold. How could anyone sleep in there, especially on that kind of hard bed? Their cells were real tombs. It was inside this hut, which smelled like a muddy tomb, that Yerunda sat and did his vigil every night, with noetic prayer for eight to ten hours. When he closed the door, it became pitch black and no fresh air came in. It was a sheer martyrdom. Their chapel was so small that you could almost reach the iconostasis while standing in your stall, but it was very compunctious. They dedicated it to St. John the Forerunner. The neighboring brotherhood of Father Daniel offered to paint the icons for it. 
Later they also planted three little orange trees below the chapel. But there was no more room on that ledge of the cliff to plant anything else, no matter how much they needed it. Besides, had they planted anything else, the frequent rock slides would have destroyed anything outside the caves. At first their life was truly harsh and uncomfortable, since they lacked even the most basic essentials. Yet despite the numerous inconveniences, the cramped space, and the flimsiness of their huts, they were very happy because no one bothered them. They were isolated on the side of a cliff, where there wasn't any path for people to pass by, so they were always alone and had indescribable stillness. They had no cares, since they didn't have a garden. All they had was their huts and something for cooking. Those were their only provisions. They had the virtue of poverty to the extreme. They intentionally avoided comforts and lived with whatever was simple so that they would have, a few, would have few cares. This would allow them to concentrate on their spiritual life of prayer and contemplation. Sleeplessness. Elder Joseph's move to this rough place did not please the subterranean demons who wanted those caves for themselves. They began to disturb Yerunda on a daily basis. Later he would tell his disciples, you came here and, and found everything ready. If, only, if you only knew what I went through in the beginning here from the demons. The priests in the world exorcise the demons and command them to go to deserted places, which is why they had all piled up here. If you only knew what I went through. What he was implying was that if his disciples had arrived back then, they would not have lasted. In order to ruin Yeranda's vigil, the demons started waking him up with loud noises every evening after sleeping for only an hour or an hour and a half. Afterwards, demons would appear to him with grotesque faces and he wouldn't be able to fall asleep again. This situation kept dragging on. Day by day, Yerunda began to grow more and more tired since he couldn't sleep regularly and since he refused to omit doing his vigil. Furthermore, he was deprived of the special grace from prayer because the lack of sleep clouded his mind and prevented him from concentrating. Nevertheless, he would not give up easily. He said to himself, I will be patient with this situation for a month. And if the problem has not been resolved by then, I will leave this place. Yeranda gradually started to feel the deprivation of grace. Many times he couldn't control himself and kept weeping and weeping inconsolably for days or even weeks. Because of this situation, he fell into great sorrow. He started to complain, in a sense, to God as if he had been treated unjustly. He was complaining because God kept allowing so many temptations to befall him without curbing them even a little so that he couldn't even catch his breath. As he was praying with tears and pain in the darkness, he arose, raised his hands and said, O oh Lord, will you even let them defeat man's volition? If so, then how will man fight? Then his little hut suddenly filled with light, and he heard his very sweet voice say to him, Will you not endure everything for my love? Upon hearing the, those words, his sorrow immediately dispersed, as if a heavy dark cloud had left him. Right away he realized where that voice was from, and he fell down on his face and began to weep with much love, repenting for his despondency that had overcome him. Yes, my God, for your love I will be patient. Later he would say, I shall never forget that voice which was so sweet that the temptation and all my faint-heartedness immediately dispersed. From then on, Yeranda had great consolation in his sorrows and afflictions. He regained his spiritual strength and thenceforth had greater fortitude in temptations. After patiently enduring the temptation of sleeplessness for 30 days, the battle finally ended and the demons vanished. Their schedule. Their ascetical schedule at the small skeet of St. Anne was as follows. 
At dawn, they woke up and began work. Their work would either be to make some handicraft or to do some other necessary manual labor. At noon, each of them would go to his own cell and to do vespers on his prayer rope. If there was extra time, they would also do some reading. Afterwards, they would all gather together for lunch. Next, they received Yerenda's blessing and retired to their cells to sleep for three hours until sunset. At sunset, they arose, drank some coffee, and began their vigil, which lasted until midnight. When they had a priest, they would begin the divine liturgy at midnight in their little chapel. When they had no priest, they continued their vigil in their cells, either with reading or more prayer. After the divine liturgy, they would rest until sunrise. Thus, they slept a total of six hours in two three-hour shifts. This schedule helped them greatly in their vigils. Yerondu would never change this schedule because he knew that changing it would adversely affect his prayer. He emphasized in his teachings, if you work more or less during the daytime, your body will be affected analogously. As a result, your noose will be scattered, which will diminish your eagerness for prayer. This is why he kept his schedule with great precision, even at difficult times in his life. Of course, things were easier for him because of his character, which was orderly, decisive, and unyielding. The following event demonstrates how much importance Yerunda attached to keeping his hesychistic schedule. One day during the rest period, his disciples returned from afar loaded up with provisions and some fish. They said to him, Yerunda, we brought some fish, and if we don't cook them now, they will spoil. There certainly weren't any refrigerators in St. Anne's ski then. Bear in mind that fish was a rare treat for them, not simply because they were ascetics, but also because fish was expensive to buy and toilsome to catch. Without even discussing the matter, Yerunda replied, I would rather have the fish spoil than to spoil my schedule. Leave the fish as they are and go rest. The next day, he said to his disciples, I intentionally let the fish spoil so that for the rest of your lives you will remember the value of orderliness. He frequently emphasized, Be careful with our schedule. Father Arsenios and I shed our blood to present it ready for you. The Joy of Hezekiah At the beginning of our monastic life, the fathers say we cultivate the virtues with toil and difficulty. But as we progress, then we work joyfully with the de determination, desire, and a holy flame. Yerande was very pleased with his new ascetic dwelling. He enthusiastically wrote to his sister, We hear my sister don't sleep at all that night. Every night we have a vigil. We pray for the whole world all night. Only in the morning and midday do we rest a little after we eat. This is our rule. Half the day we work, the rest of the time we rest in silence and are content. Ascetical life, wilderness, angelic life, full of grace. If only you were here to see us. Oh, if only it were possible for you to see us. Here, my sister, is earthly paradise, and if from the beginning one lays hold of, dem of the demanding lofty life lifestyle, he becomes a saint. At the beginning of their stay there, no one knew about them. However, in accordance with the Lord's words, a city that is set on a hill cannot be laid, but cannot be hid. The fragrance of Yerinda's virtuous life could not be hidden. Gradually, the neighborhooding fathers learned of his holiness, and several of them began to visit him for spiritual benefit. Unfortunately, however, some other people without interest in spiritual matters found him, and they simply wanted to pass their time with unprofitable discussions due to their idleness. He saw that he did not benefit from those acts of love, but only ruined his soul. That is when he decided to put a gate at the only entrance to their enclosure to keep visitors out and preserve his hesychistic schedule. He would keep the gate locked almost the entire day so that he would at least benefit from the prayer in Hezekiah, since right from the start of his monastic life this is how he had learned to live. In this manner, he managed to be more rested for his vigil. He thought to himself, What benefit will I offer to my neighbor if I myself am darkened by other people's words? 
but when I remain in peace and illumined by the light of God, I will be able to transmit what I have to others, and in this way I will fulfill Christ's commandment of love. He took care not to waste the precious time of early evening. He saw that whenever he kept it with peace and the fear of God, he would have so much spiritual fruit that he would be amazed at the benefit of orderliness and freedom from cares. So he made a sign that said, Do not knock. I do not want discussions, idle talk, and criticisms of others. Nevertheless, he would leave the gate open for two or three hours in the morning. With this method, he had absolute stillness. Full of joy, he wrote to someone, I am the most fortunate of men because I live without worries, enjoying the honey of Hezekiah without any, any inter interruption. When grace withdraws, though, Hezekiah, like another grace, shelters me in its bosom, and the pains and sorrows of this evil and toilsome life seem even smaller. He even composed poems, such as the following one. I found here a haven of stillness. Be healthy, my soul and my body. Swim, O my noose, in the sweetest tranquility, and ask not at all what your neighbor is doing. Yerunda sought Hezekiah and seclusion as the means for achieving the acquisition of the Holy Spirit through prayer.